Now let's continue on with Sabbath services. Let's pick up right where we left off when we took a break. 1 Corinthians 2. Now let's read verse 11 again because this verse you can read and read and read and read and read and then study other parts of your Bible and you will see how God reveals these things step by step, which we'll look at in just a bit. Verse 9. But according as it is written, the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. So great and so far above what we think or do, that no man can imagine it. Now, everybody likes to talk about living forever, but that doesn't give you understanding with God's plan. See? The things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Okay? It must be spiritually revealed and understood. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Word of God. What did Jesus say? He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And the words that are written down carries that same meaning from the words that are written down into our minds as we read them, coupled with God's spirit. Okay. Now, if you don't have God's Spirit, you won't have a clue as to what it's understanding, what it's teaching, because God has designed the Bible in such a way that there's a little here, there's a little there, the precept upon precept and line upon line, and only those who love him and keep his commandments will understand. Those who don't, it's going to cause them to stumble and fall. Isaiah 28. For the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Now we'll see how far we can get into that between now and the end of unleavened bread. For who among men understands the things of man except by the Spirit of man which is in him? In the same way also, the things of God no one understands except by the Spirit of God. Now notice verse 12. Now we have not received the spirit of the world. What is the spirit of the world? Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. The prince of the power of the air. That spirit that works in the children of disobedience. See? So that's why someone who picks up the Bible and they know nothing about God, and they're really not interested, but they want to look at the Bible to find fault with it, they won't understand a thing. But those who yield to God, those who have the Spirit of God, and think of this, how many really had the Spirit of God down through time? The patriarchs, some of the kings, some of the, the priest, okay, until the coming of Christ. And then, think of this. How much did the apostles really grasp and understand of what they wrote? We don't know. We have no idea, but look at how late it was. It was the last two epistles of Paul that he wrote about the things of God before the ages of time. Okay. Spirit of the world, but the spirit that is of God comes from, a, comes from God. Now stop and think about this for a minute too. This is something we need to always remember in everything that we do. It says right over here in 1 Corinthians 4, 
that we have nothing that we didn't receive. Now, I want you to take that and think about that and apply it. Just take one day and you will understand that everything that you have, that you see, that you touch, that you wear, that you think, that you are, you received. Right? Everything. See? So, why do people get lifted up in their great vanities? Because they don't know God. See? There's nothing to get lifted up in vain about because you have nothing you didn't receive. But be thankful and grateful that God has given it. And God is the one who gives understanding. The knowledge we have of the Sabbath, and Passover, and Holy Days is the greatest foundation of knowledge that any human being can have. See? Coupled with God's Spirit, then he reveals his plan to us step by step by step. Okay? That's why we have the book, God's Plan Revealed. Now, this is one of the last books that I've written. And it wasn't that I wrote it to write it out. It is it came from messages and sermons over a long period of time that were transcribed okay, and recorded and transcribed and put in the book. So if you don't have the book, God's plan revealed by his Sabbath and his holy days, then you email us, you write us, you need that book. And if you have a family where you need more than one, we'll send you whatever you need so that each person can have their own copy. Okay? But that was put together after, let's see, I was ordained in 1965, so that's 35 and 22, so that's 57 years. Okay? You don't take something like that and start it the day after you're baptized. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Because down through time, there are things in the Bible that you don't understand until you have learned certain other things about the Bible first. That's why we tell all young people and teenagers, study the book of Proverbs. Because the first thing you need to do is get your mind focused in the right direction. That you know right and wrong, good from evil, righteousness from wickedness. Okay? So that you understand that just the human nature alone is not going to profit you in anything good in the long run if you're fighting against God. You will receive something else, not from God, but from Satan the devil. And that's what's happened to all of our young folks. See? Think about the idiots it's producing with TikTok. Huh? A generation of idiots. All right. But the spirit that is of God, so that we might know the things graciously given to us by God. Verse 13. Which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom. You can have a hundred PhDs and you're ignorant. You can be a high school graduate and if you love God and keep his commandments or baptized and receive his Holy Spirit, you know more than the person who has a hundred PhDs. See? Because his wisdom is all the wisdom of the world and Satan the devil. See? 
But God has given us his wisdom, his understanding. But in words taught by the Holy Spirit, in order to communicate spiritual things by spiritual means. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Hmm? Now, the only thing that removes that is baptism. Repentance and baptism. Then you have the circumcision of the mind, which then, with God's Spirit in your mind, you begin to understand things step by step. Okay? Now let's come back to Genesis 15 and let's see where the first Passover actually began. And let's remember while we're turning back there to Genesis 15 that it tells us in Galatians, the third chapter, that if we are Christ, we are what? Remember what it says? That if we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? Now, Genesis 15. This is something that I did not understand until had to start writing the Passover book, okay? I think I understood some of it, okay? But let's look at it, because here's the very beginning of everything that we're going to do, starting with the Passover, which we're going to have in two weeks. So let's pick it up here in verse 3. And Abram said, Behold, you have given no seed to me, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. That was the law. Okay? Now, when this was given, he was 85 years old. Okay? Now, I don't know how long that Sarah and, and Abraham were married. And I don't know how, how many times they tried to have children, see, and couldn't, which back then was a great disgrace if you didn't, right? Okay. So here's what God said. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own loins shall be your heir. Now, that's quite a promise at 85. And, of course, they lived longer than we do today. 85 today, you can talk about being dead reproductively. That is a true statement. Okay? Verse 5. And he brought him outside. Okay. Now notice what he said. Let's look at what that means. Look now toward the heavens and number the stars if you are able to count them. Now back then, there was no small. Okay. And back then, since this was going to be the night of the Passover, the moon was nearly full. See? Now you can check it out this year. Right after Passover, you go outside and look where the moon is, and it's almost full. You go out the next night, and you have a full moon. That's because the calculated Hebrew calendar is the most accurate way of keeping time, and that's what God uses, okay? 
And he said to him, So shall your seed be. Now think about that. Starting from zero. Now let's go back to Genesis 12. Just, just look at this for just a minute. His calling. Okay. Genesis 12. Okay. So here's what Abraham had to give up. Now you stop and think about what have you had to give up because of your having to be baptized, huh? Okay. Remember, whatever you gave up is nothing compared to what God is going to give you. Okay. But here's what he said. Verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house into a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. How great is the name of Abraham coming down to our day? Huh? How great will his name be at the resurrection? Huh? See, because God doesn't think in terms like we do. He thinks in terms way beyond. There it is. Make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And in you, now notice this, underline this, shall all, circle that, families of the earth be blessed. Now, you can't understand what that means until you know about the truth of the resurrections. See? So when God said, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, okay? That promise strings clear out through all human history past, present, and future, millennium, second resurrection, and entering into the kingdom of God. This one verse, okay? So here's the start of it, Genesis 15. Okay? When you go out and look at the heavens, now I suggest this. Anyone who is down, discouraged, or you don't know how you're going to come out of your predicament, and uh, you can use your, your cell phone or computer to help you do it. Go on Hubble Telescope or Jack Webb Telescope and look at the pictures of the universe. Even Abraham couldn't see it like you can see it there. See, And think about what God has done. And think about that he has purpose for the whole universe. And think about that you've been called to partake of that. That is an amazing thing. And he believed in the Lord. Okay. Question. When do you see the stars? At noon? No. You see them at night. Right? Okay. So here's one day. When does the day begin? Bible. Sunset. Okay? This is after the beginning of the day. And we'll see there was a two-day sequence, and we, we have seen that there's a two-day sequence in the book of Exodus for the exodus of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, the Passover, and the first day of unleavened bread. Okay? So this is the first of it right here. This is on the Passover day because... It says in Exodus 12, and it came to pass that on the selfsame day, 430 years later, the children of Israel left with a high hand, right? Okay. Now, we have a chart we're putting up online so that you can understand the 30-year difference. And I asked Michael Heiss, I said, um, how do the Jews interpret that? 
He says, they don't. Same way with Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Prophecy of the Messiah. I said, how do they understand that? He said, they don't. See? Amazing. They've got all this complicated religion, and so do the Catholics, and so do the Protestants. And they have no understanding because they're unwilling to keep the Sabbath and to keep the holy days, and they're unwilling to believe God. They only want to believe what they want to believe. Okay? So he believed in the Lord, and it accounted to him for righteousness. All right? So it doesn't tell us, but apparently Abraham went in and slept that night. Or maybe he couldn't sleep that night. Who knows? I mean, after being told that, you know, here you are. However long you've been married, trying to have children, no children, God comes and says, you look at the heavens. And if you're able to count the stars, that's how your seed's going to be. <laughs> I don't think he was able to sleep much that night. All right. So then he tells him. Verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to inherit it. Now he walked over this land, covered all of that land, and he never owned it. And then you read in Romans, the fourth chapter, that he understood he was going to be heir of the world. Huh. A later revelation of truth of how great God's word is, huh? Think of that. All right, let's come back here. And he said, Lord God, that's probably in the morning. By what shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, take me a heifer three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took all these by himself and divided them in the middle. That is, cut them down the spine and laid each piece opposite the other, made a little path between the two of them. But he did not divide the birds. Okay. Now then, I don't know how long it took him to, to do that. I don't know if he had an extra sharp axe that he could cut down through the spine. But I mean, that's a pretty good amount of work. Okay. Now, there they were laid out there. The blood, the guts, the gore. Okay. That's kind of like looking at the whole history of mankind. The blood, the, the guts, the gore. I got a book called the, the Langer's Encyclopedia of History, and it's just one war after coup, after kingship, after conquering, enslavement, after another, down through the whole history of the world. I mean, stop and think about how many wars we have experienced just ourselves in our lifetime, okay? Not that we were out there fighting it, but at my age, there's World War I, Korean War, Vietnam War, two Iraq wars, Afghanistan War. Huh. Now, the war from invasion from the southern border and the war in the Ukraine and the war in Uzbekistan and the war in Ethiopia, which fulfills the word of God that says, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Huh. Is the word of God true or not? Yes. Okay. So here we are, Abraham. Okay. Now let's see there's a flow of time here. Verse 11. And when the birds of prey came down upon the carcass. Now what's that going to be? the vultures, the ravens, you know, and you can see this on any documentary of, 
of Africa and what happens. Boy, and I tell you, those vultures, they can get in there and they can clean out a carcass like you would never believe. And they are the ugliest looking things you would ever want to see. But what a purpose God has in cleaning up dead carcasses on the ground. Okay, so here they are. Here they come. So Abram drove them away. Now, verse 12. Okay. Remember, when does the day end? Sometime. Okay. We're going to see that the timing of this is precisely the timing this defined in the New Testament, the sixth hour when Jesus died. But you wouldn't know by reading here. Look at all that had to take place and all that had to, to transpire to get up to the point of the life and death of Jesus Christ in order to understand the timing of when this took place connecting with his death. Okay? So see how great God's Spirit is, okay? Okay? Verse 12, and it came to pass as the sun was going down that a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now, what does that signify? That was a type of death. So God wanted him to experience that. Okay? And behold, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. He wanted him to have a prophetic experience of the death of the coming Savior. Okay. And he said to Abram, you must surely know that your seed shall be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. That's why you need to look at the chart. And I also will judge the nation whom they shall serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. One verse about everything that happened in the book of Exodus concerning the children of Israel and what happened in the plagues and the, the thing with the Passover and how God saved the children of Israel. One verse. Okay. Okay. Look at all the verses that explain all the details about it. Now, then you come forward to the New Testament times and about the time when Jesus was to be crucified, and you've got all the details about the, those days, everything leading up to it. We've got in the harmony of the Gospels, the last 10 days of Jesus' life, all laid out day by day, verse by verse. See? So did that happen exactly as he said to Israel? Did they leave with great substance? Yes. And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Okay. And it came to pass... When the sun went down, what did that do? That ended the day. That ended the 14th, right? Okay. We know it's the 14th from Exodus 12. Okay. When it went down, that began what day? The 15th. Okay. When the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp pass between those pieces. Okay. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, okay. Now when, it, when God makes a covenant, now remember, we're keeping the Passover, which is what? The new covenant, right? God has made a covenant with us. I will give you eternal life if you love me and obey me and you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's the start, see. 
He wants us to grow in grace and knowledge. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. And then he lists all of the Canaanites and so forth. Okay. Now, what happened when he passed between the pieces? Okay. God walked between them. Now, notice, Abraham did not. Because this was a unilateral promise by God. Abraham's part did not come until Genesis 22. When he offered Isaac, but God spared him. Now for the physical nations, that began when he was 99, with circumcision. And that was 14 years later. See, so God doesn't do everything all at once. Can you imagine the surprise of Abraham when he's resurrected and on the sea of glass and God tells him everything that has happened? And then he tells him to come over here to the edge of the sea of glass. And he says, you look down there, and this group of armies over here, they are your descendants. And this group of armies over here are your descendants. Isn't that going to be something? All right. So he walked between them, and it doesn't tell us but since God did it, since it was a smoking furnace, now what happens when something is in a furnace? It burns up. And the, the light that passed through it showed God walking through it, and behind it, everything burned out. So when Abraham awoke from his sleep and looked, where's the sacrifice? I suppose, now I'll ring my cowbell because I don't know for sure, but I can be fairly sure that it was nothing but ashes. See? Why? Because all sacrifices like that had to be burned completely. See? So imagine the astonishment of Abraham when he awoke from that. See? Now then, let's cover one, one other thing. When I first got this paper, if you don't have this paper by... Graby and Kuhn, but Kuhn is the one who wrote it, okay? This assault against the Church of God and the Passover. When I first got that and read that, you'll see all my notes that I wrote on it 44 years ago when I got it, 45 years ago, whatever it is, okay? Because they were telling us that the Jews' practice was that they sacrificed the lambs at the temple late in the afternoon of the 14th. Okay? Whereas when you read the book of Exodus chapter 12, they kept the Passover as it was getting dark at the beginning of the 14th. Okay? So the question became, and in my mind, okay, became this. If I cannot find a place in the scriptures where God has used sunset, bar Erev, in connection with Ben Habar by Eim between the two evenings, 
And if I cannot find in the Bible that there's a difference between sunset and twilight, or as they like to read it in the King James, evening, okay, and evening. So, I found it in Exodus 16. Now, it's properly translated in the faithful version, okay? Now, we can document the time by the calculated Hebrew calendar that the 15th day of the second month was a Sabbath. Okay. And the children of Israel were saying, oh, Moses, we're hungry. What are we going to eat? And so Moses had to tell them, don't come to me. You're not complaining to me. You're complaining to God. So then God answered, okay. Here's what the message came from the Lord. Let's pick it up here in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will cause bread from heaven for you to rain from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather a certain amount every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my ways or not, in my law or not. Okay? And it shall come to pass... On the sixth day, they shall prepare what they shall bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather day by day. And Moses and Aaron told the children of Israel, at sunset, that's evening, that's Ba'erev, see? Sunset, and Shachan has it correct. The Shachan Bible has it correct, okay? And I didn't know that until after two years after I wrote the Passover book. At sunset, then you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And at sunrise, okay, now what does sunset do? It ends the day. And if this was the Sabbath day, which it was, what does that do? That ends... The Sabbath, correct? Okay. Because it says in Leviticus 23, 32, you shall observe your Sabbath from sunset to sunset, from the ninth day of the month at sunset. That begins the tenth day, right? Okay. And atonement is the tenth day of the month. And the reason that God gave that that way was because it's so important that everybody do it exactly correctly on atonement, because if not, you'd be cut off from the people, right? Okay. At sunset, which ends the Sabbath, then you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And at sunrise... You shall see the glory of the Lord. So that means beginning of the day portion of the first day of the week. Right? And he said, how many days you shall gather? Six days. So that's the morning of the first day. Okay. You shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your murmuring against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us. And Moses said, you shall see when the Lord will give you flesh to eat at sunset. Now, what did he do? He sent quail, right? Okay. Now, what did God tell him about on the Sabbath? He said, don't go out and look for manna because you won't find any. And what happened? People went out looking for manna on the Sabbath. And he called Moses and said, how long do these people refuse to keep my laws? See? I mean, right there in the presence of God. <laughs> we went out and did 
what he said don't do. I've heard your murmurings, what are we? You shall see when the Lord will give you flesh to eat at sunset. Now, here's what's important. There's one man who said, well, God had mercy and said it in the afternoon of the Sabbath. So they could clean it and all of that. That's God making them break the Sabbath, if that's the fact. See? But this gives us a time sequence. So remember, okay? At sunset, give you flesh to eat and bread to the full at sunrise. Okay, so he spoke to them. Now, verse 12. Remember, we just read he's going to send it at sunset. Now, this becomes important. Verse 12. I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak to them, saying, between the two evenings, Bain Har Baim, you shall eat flesh. Ha! Huh. If the quail were sent at sunset, what was the sun doing while they were gathered? And he dropped it right on the encampment. He didn't put it out around about, it was right on the encampment. Okay? All he had to do is reach up and grab it ring its neck, skin them out, put them on the fire, and you can eat those little quail breasts in about 20 minutes, right? Okay. But what's happened to the sun? It went down, ending the day, right? Okay. Boom. Here come all the quail. Then they have to take them off the top of the tents, pick them up off the ground. They have to prepare them, and then it's getting darker, right? All the time, it's getting darker and later. So between the two evenings, between sunset and dark, you shall eat the flesh. You can't eat it before it comes. Can't be the afternoon of the Sabbath. Otherwise, God would break his Sabbath and what did he tell them about the manna and the Sabbath day? Don't go out and look for it because you won't find any. Okay? So God kept his own law. So here we have a sequence of what? Two days. One, the Sabbath. The next day, beginning at sunset, here come the quail. And they ate it between the two evenings. What does this prove? This proves that Bain Ha'ar Baim does not come before sunset. Because they didn't eat any of the quail before they came. Well, huh? So that's a great truth in understanding the setting of this. All right? Well, I covered everything I didn't, I, I wanted to cover and a lot of things I never expected to cover, but that's the way it goes sometimes. Okay? So we'll sign off from the live streaming and see you next Sabbath.